Hi everyone, this is David from Ultimate Guitar and we are here with Alex Kolnick of Testament and of course many other projects. Alex, it's a great honor seeing you here. Uh, thanks David, it's great to be here. I enjoy Ultimate Guitar, I enjoy the debates and the, the, <laughs> the, com the community and uh, of course the articles. Okay, uh, do you sometimes go in there and like visit the comment section once in a while? I do. Uh, you know, I get Google alerts. So, <laughs> confession, <laughs> my when my name is mentioned, I I go and see. You know, and the, you know. Um, you, usually, it's an article. Sometimes it's it's a comment. Yeah, you know, mostly positive comments. But you know, I understand it's par for the course. For the for the most part, it's you know, it's 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 pretty nice. Yeah, I, I check out other articles uh, articles on on friends of mine. You know, Stu Ham's got a new project. I guess I get mentioned in a lot of his articles now because I'm on his new record. Yeah, it's fun. It's fun. Yeah, it's fun to enjoy the reactions. Absolutely. Now, uh, you at the moment you're like juggling a lot of things. You know, apart from Testament, like there's also uh, Stu Ham and his stuff, and uh, you also have in the fact, and you have your podcast. And how do you actually manage to, you know, do all of these things? Uh, there's a lot of juggling involved for sure, but uh, yeah, definitely a lot of uh, a lot of note taking to keep things organized. Yeah, absolutely. Now you also started your podcast called Moods and Modes with Alex Kolnick. Uh, I love how the name of the podcast podcast kind of implies and reflects the fact that you can use modes and different scales to build build different moods. Um, is this also something that you discuss on that po podcast? Can you walk us a little through that? Well, the original idea for the podcast was to have one-on-one -on -one jam sessions. And with these would be with uh, friends of mine, uh, musician friends, where in which uh, there was a lot of improvisation. Of, you know, in some cases well-known musicians and other cases musicians that I thought more people should know about. Um, I've been thinking about this for years, honestly, uh, since the 2000s. And uh, I was a big fan of, of you know, radio short stories like on um, NPR and also uh, this program called Piano Jazz, which was NPR's longest running program. You know, Marion McPartland one on one with another musician, usually a piano player. So I had an idea of doing something like that for guitar. It took forever to <laughs> to get it together between uh, composing my own albums and touring, uh, Testament resurrecting in the two thousands, and then um, becoming very busy with that. And I finally started to get together just in time for the pandemic. <laughs> and, uh, Right, and that's when people couldn't be in the same room together. So by that point, I had already recorded several episodes uh, with friends before there was this pandemic. Uh, in which case, uh, yeah, we'd meet at a common at a studio, or uh, they more often than not they'd come uh, visit me in my living room, and I just mic us both up with an amp. We'd talk guitars, and it worked fine. But uh, once we couldn't be in the same room together during the pandemic, uh, I had to improvise and, <laughs> and not just improvise on guitar. And, uh, you know, fortunately by then we had platforms like this one, like what we're on now, Riverside or Zoom, the very popular one. And um, yeah, I just kind of figured out a way to do the podcast where we didn't have to be in the same place and uh, we could just talk and whatever music came up, I could play samples of it. And uh, it just it went in many directions. It's become a little bit more of a short story podcast. Um, yeah, you know, unfortunately, several very important musicians have passed away in the time since I started the podcast, including Peter Green, uh, Eddie Van Halen, Chick Corea, Jeff Beck, and you know when somebody like that passes, it only makes sense to do a, a tribute episode yeah. so on the bright side i was able to do these uh, very well received tribute episodes but uh also you know there's different modes of being in music especially today you know now we have uh this technology uh a lot of us make music at home we have recording technology so we're in producer mode <laughs> uh 
right? We're, we have social media platforms, so that puts us in uh, PR mode. And if we, you know, we have our instrument with us and we're playing on the instrument, then we're in uh, musician mode. And we also have AI, you know, maybe that will also impact the way we create music and consume music, I guess. Uh, yes, and that's a very recent technology. And it remains to be seen how that impacts music and um, the music industry as a whole. It's a little bit scary in a way, but uh, as somebody that does a lot of improvisational music, uh, even though I'm, I'm best known for my work playing heavy metal, uh, I know the improvisational music is very hard to replicate. But I cannot picture AI doing what we do as live musicians, uh, playing off of each other and giving the human touch to music. I can understand it with other music. Um, I'm not sure it, it would work for heavy metal. I would imagine some types of heavy metal. I'm sure AI could come up with a riff, you know. Here's, you know, come up with something that sounds like Judas Priest or whatever. Um, but I don't know how convincing that would be. Uh, I know it's it has worked with uh, some of the more recent pop music such as Drake and The Weeknd, but that music's pretty mechanical to begin with. Yeah. So to me, that already sounds like uh, a machine <laughs> came up with it. So I think music like that is much more in danger than uh, guitar music, at least for now. Yeah, yeah, maybe someday, but for now we're safe, I guess. <laughs> yeah, of course. You also mentioned Stu Ham, uh, and I recently also got the chance to talk to him and talk about his new album, which also features you on the guitar, Hold Fast. Uh, can you take us through this record and what are some of the highlight moments from the recording sessions? Let me, uh, let me first say that uh, to record with Stu is a great honor and a long time in the making. Uh, we first recorded in the 90s. Sorry, we let me rephrase that. We first toured together, worked together in the 90s. And, um, you know, he was trying out guitar players and he, at that time, was very known for his associations with Steve Vai and Joe Satriani. But, you know, being the, the bassist and Joe starting out, you know, he didn't have their platforms. And obviously guys like that, you know, were very busy. So he was looking for guitar players. And um, it was a, just a real, um, a real turning point for me to to get that gig. I know there were, there were some, you know, full-time instrumental players that were trying out, uh, some na name players. And, um, uh, for, you know, just for, for me, it was this big break. It really opened a lot of doors. Um, at that point, I, w I think I was maybe 21 years old. I mean, I was just a few years out of high school. I spent the last couple of years just sort of in this intense environment of uh, the band in its earlier years. Uh, going into the studio, uh, jumping on a tour, supporting a group like Anthrax or Overkill, uh, being pressured to come up with parts, uh, throwing together music, getting thrown back in the studio, doing it all over. Uh, and during that time, I developed an, you know, an interest in instrumental music and just you know, improvisation of all types, jazz, guitar, world music, rock, improvisation, you, you name it. And, you know, I'm still very young, so I was expanding as a musician. And um, to play with Stu, you know, the guy with from Satch and Vi, and I'd seen him with Satch on the Surfing with the Alien tour and just was knocked out, you know. That, yeah. that was just a, an incredible moment. Uh, that that was just amazing, and I really had to step it up because the guitar players on his early work included er names like Eric Johnson, Alan Holdsworth, as well as you know Satch and Vi so it's like okay, <laughs> as hard as I've practiced to be this metal guitarist to be the guitarist in Testament, I got to step it way way up. So it was really like starting over, and. Um, uh, we had talked about 
recording, but um, it just didn't happen for a, a number of reasons. Uh, he he went through record label changes. Uh, he didn't end up recording after uh, that tour we did together uh, for a long, long time. And I think by that point, I had moved to the East Coast and I was kind of in my jazz hiatus mode. I was going back to school. I was determined to get a university degree in music, which I did at the new school. And um, so I was on the East Coast. He had, ironically, he had relocated to the San Francisco Bay Area for a time, which I, and I'm sure had I still been there, we would have <laughs> recorded it. But all of which is a long way of saying, that, yeah, this recording was long, long overdue. Uh, and we started touring together over the last uh yeah, last 10 years, I think starting in 2013 or so. And um, I regularly do his uh, shows at the Baked Potato. Uh, Stu's Baked Potato shows are legendary. And you always get great musicians showing up. You never know who's going to be there. Uh, the last one, Vi himself showed up. No pressure playing with him sitting there. <laughs> he, he was great, by the way. Super supportive. Uh, my friend Ash Sidarf, um our artist here, uh, Farah, from Stones and Farah, has come twice, and being, you know, he's just a ma major influence, uh, with Jorge, along with Jorge Struns. Uh, Rhonda Smith came uh, one time, and, you know, there's Jeff Beck's bass player, and uh, it's just so, so many great musicians. So it's been this great hang, and the, the tours we've done have been great. And we've been talking about recording this whole time. You know, this is <laughs> has been going on for, you know, since the mid 2010s. So finally, finally, we get in the studio. Uh, of course, the pandemic delayed it as well. By 2021, it was finally safe to go in, and we did it uh, at Sweetwater. Our friends at Sweetwater set up a recording masterclass. So uh, audio students could watch us record and they were let in on the process, sort of guided by the engineer. And uh, we each did a, an instrumental master class. And uh, it was a lot of fun. It was, it was, uh, you know, it was intense. It was intense because, uh, yeah, it was a music's challenging. And even, yeah. you know, even though Stu, Stu gets identified with, you know, the, the Satch and Vi stuff, not that that isn't challenging, but his... His own music has its own unique challenges. It's much more diverse. It goes in a lot of directions. Uh, yeah. He's very specific about what he wants. And um, the, so you, uh, you, I guess you mentioned Hold Fast. Well, that's the title. And yeah. that's that's one of the tunes. Um, I think the tune uh, Flotsam and Jetsam is a big moment. Uh, it's a, an extended piece. And it's one of those pieces where you know, the guitar just has to play and it's got to rip and it doesn't stop. It just keeps going. So you go, you have to uh, keep it interesting, which which isn't easy. And, uh, you, you know, not repeating yourself, uh, which which is really tough. Yeah. Now, um, one thing that uh, I remembered while talking to Stu, uh, to Stu, he mentioned how he ended up hiring you. You were a young guitar player. He, he ended up hiring you because you were the uh, the only guy who showed up and played an improvised solo. Now, you built your career on being able to improvise. So I have a couple of questions about that. And the first one is um, uh, there are solos that you perform live, like let's say the Testament, that's like they say, sound the same as on the recording. But when you start writing a solo, do all of your solos start off as like improvisations at home or wherever, and then just, you know, build up from there? Or do you like kind of start with a composition mindset? How does it start for you? Yeah, well, I'll start with uh, the, the audition that you mentioned and, uh, you know, coming in and not playing the same solos that, uh, Alan Holtworth and Eric Johnson had played on Stu's record. For one thing, um, I had seen Alan Holdsworth at that point. I was a huge fan. At, by that point, I was, he was in, influencing my solos with Testament. But I knew he didn't play the same solos. Ever. They were completely different. Um, 
even times where I thought, okay, maybe he should reference the original solo, like in Metal Fatigue, he's got this beautiful melody, and but it's fine. <laughs> he, he, he just goes for something new. And um, I don't think there's any way anybody can play like him. Exactly. Um, so it just it just made sense. I realized anybody that tries to play what Alan played on Stu's record, it's just it's just not going to happen. So um, I didn't know that would uh, look be looked on upon favorably. I'm glad it, it was, but it just seemed like the the logical thing to do. Uh, so as far as solos that I do with Testament, yeah, it always starts with improvisation. The first thing I do is improvise. Uh, it's it's a little uh, more of an ev- involved process because in that situation you do have to live with those solos. Uh, I learned that on the very first Testament tour, I was getting questions. You know, with the, we were on our first record and people were getting to know the solos, and you know, people would come up and say, "On the record, you played this. I want to, you know." <laughs> and then the band talked to me, and I, I realized, okay, for that genre, yeah, that, and that, that's what you got to do, and that's one of the reasons I had to car, I looked to carve out some outlets for improvisation over the years, while respecting that when I'm in a situation where the, a solo is expected a certain way, I will play that. I may do little tweaks, you know, to keep it interesting for me. In fact, I always do. But so it's never note for note, but it's close enough. It's recognizable. All the signature parts are there, and I've you know, I've never gotten any complaints. But again, it starts with one big improvisation, and it usually takes a few passes until there's a few bars that I like, and then I put that aside and I'll say, okay, I like a, you know a few. I like three or four bars out of. 12 or 24 bars or whatever it is. And I put that aside. I do some more passes. Okay, I liked what I played in this section. So it's really like um, a blending of these small sections that I like. And then once you put them together, you might realize, oh, you know, what I did in the middle would make a great intro to the solo. That should start the solo. Or maybe it's the reverse. Maybe, you know, the way I started it is is too much. I should build up to that because the solo has nowhere to go. I'm going to put that at the end. Or any type of variation. You know, it can happen in a number of different ways. What would be your best advice for someone who wants to get improvisation, who isn't used to it? How should they start, you know, going about it and, you know, getting used to the whole thing? It takes time to develop. So I think, you know, one of the first things is to accept that it's going to take longer than you think it is. This is true of almost everything. The, the recording process, the, the records always take longer. They did back in the day, too. You know, there was, you always had to extend the amount of time. And that could not be more true for learning, learning the guitar. So the first thing is... Um, Allow yourself that time, accept it, and be uh, you know be accepting, be easy on on yourself because uh, it's not going to come to you right away. And also, the more you stick with it, the more things start to happen. So you have to get through these periods where it feels like you're not making any progress at all. Um, you, you just want to stop or do something else. And there are times where you should take a break. Maybe you're burning yourself out. You know, specifically learning to improvise. I mean, there's, yeah, play, it depends on the player's level. Um, what are they able to play at, at that time? So, if somebody is already playing and, you know, they have a sound and they, they just need help improvising, I might advise something different than if they're still, you know, learning the instrument if they're in their more formative years. But I, I recently um, worked with a friend who's, I'm not going to name him, but you know, pretty well-known b- band that packs huge places and 
wins awards and all that. You know, you, you definitely know this man. But, um, yeah, well, he, he had some questions about improvising. And uh, what I advised him was just to uh, take some examples of licks that you already know and change them around. Like one, one example I'll use is from uh, Randy Rhodes, um, the solo from Over the Mountain. Right? That's, a, that's a great solo. And that's obviously if you know, somebody's pretty advanced to play that. But it starts out with a triad, and it goes, climbs up the triad, and it goes down the scale. Da 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 right? um, and one thing you, you could do is uh, reverse that. But if you go down the triad and up the scale, da 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 da, right? So right there you have a variation, which is pretty simple. Um, but there there are so many little things you could do to improvise off of just that that lick alone. So yeah. You know, it's that starts on the one in the the groove, right? Like one, two, three, four. Da 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 da. da, da. Right. Uh, what if you start on a different beat? So instead, of, I'll do do it slower. Da 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 da. da. So one, two, three, four, one. Da 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 da. Right. And then it feels different. Yeah. You can move it to the next beat. Three, one, two, da 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 da. Right, and, and then the accent starts to shift. So right there, um, just based on that one lick and just doing that, that triggers new ideas. Now I want to go back in time a little bit. You started with Testament when you were just a kid. Uh, you left in the early nineteen nineties, like pursuing new things and everything. Uh, but this was a very kind of a turbulent time, strange time for rock music, especially with the rise of grunge and whatever, uh, especially for the bands who blew up in the 1980s. Did you ever feel like the rise of grunge and general changes in rock music ever affected your decision to leave the band? Or generally, did you feel, uh, in a way, for lack of a better word, threatened uh, by this new rise of, of the musical style? Or was it just something else for you? Uh, I was kind of fascinated by it, to be honest. Uh, um, I don't know if this is because I have um, parents who are like extreme academics, like yeah. <laughs> um, you know, PhD, uh, extreme academia, <laughs> like to a level that you know I I could never relate to. And one of the reasons I got it, into music was yeah, you know, it was just so different than yeah. Yeah, the yeah. drudgery of a academia. But I looked at the whole grunge movement, for lack of a better word, or other musical trends in the 90s, kind of from a sociological point of view. I, I didn't... I liked some of the songs, um, to be honest. I thought some of the songwriting was fantastic. Uh, in fact, even recently, I got invited to a, a concert Smashing Pumpkins, who I'd never seen before, and Jane's Addiction, who I'd never seen. Who were just, but, and both of them, just unbelievable. Um, so, you know, I, I watch those bands. Now, I, I, yeah, I totally get it. I, I dig the songs. Uh, but at the time, yeah, me as, as a musician, even though I could appreciate what they were doing, I, I thought the, yeah, the songwriting got really good. It was a lot better than some of the music it was rebelling against. And there were just, you know, uh, there was just an onslaught of cookie cutter music at the time. Now, I don't mean the originals. I, and I think a lot of really good bands uh, and good musicians unfortunately unfor got caught up in that. Um, you know, to... I mean, to me, like the, the original wave of glam metal in L.A. like had, had some great players, like you know George Lynch and 
Warren D. Martini. It's, it's fantastic. I mean, that's you know, they that's it holds up today. But it got to the point where yeah, just yeah, labels were just signing any band with that that hairdo and and the guitar solo was a part of it and yeah, some some really good music and and honest music got like got caught up in that. So it it affected uh the thrash metal bands for sure. It uh, even you know a band like Extreme, you know, uh they just released an album. And you know you know Nuno's just unbelievable as ever. Um but it's like he's a new guitar player. It's like people are just discovering him. Uh because after <laughs> that period, you know, they were what seen as one of these bands, right? Long hair, guitar solos, yeah. You know, oh, radio suddenly isn't interested. The industry isn't interested. Um, so I, it, I always thought it was kind of bizarre. You know, the 10 years before that, that music was bigger than life. Uh, the Scorpions you know, were a stadium band. Uh, meanwhile, like the Scorpions had their biggest hit during that time. But it was like all over the rest of the world. It's like the song, you know, Winds of Change. It like barely existed in the United States. Cause, and, you know, the, it wasn't the um, musicians either. It was really like, you know, it was some in the music media, some in the on the record label and PR side. I wasn't sure what was happening. I thought that this is really bizarre. It's like this herd movement. And meanwhile, um, I still like guitar solos. <laughs> I'm not going to, just because, yeah, some, you know, label jerk or, you know, Spin Magazine or whoever suddenly decides guitar solos aren't cool. I, I like, who, who are you? And meanwhile, I was getting more and more into sort of, you know, really advanced musical stuff. Um, you know, like I mentioned Alan Holdsworth earlier. Yeah. I studied him more and more. I, I was just getting more into uh, guitars that would be, I guess, categorized as jazz. You know, Jim Hall, Wes Montgomery, John Schofield, Pat Metheny, Pat Martino, George Benson, the early yeah. George Benson, pre-pop, too much stuff to name. And st started studying with, you know, advanced jazz players. And eventually, you know, like I mentioned, moved, got my university degree um and started playing jazz guitar i always thought up up I, I i wanted to balance it i'd love to come back and do some type of heavy metal and i always liked artists like john zorn yeah you know, who's an experimental artist but you know has music that's pure jazz and has music that you know you could call extreme metal yeah, yeah. He, it's I, I I always admired him, and there's a lot of lesser known artists like that. So I figured I would find my way back into metal somehow, more likely in that way, like in an arts way. But uh, as it turned out, by the mid 2000s, you know, Testament had matured and started to get things, it was like, you know, a lot like those um, VH1 behind the music specials, you know, the band yeah. goes through a bunch of drama, <laughs> doesn't get along, <laughs> then they they start to appreciate each other, they, you know, and that, that's kind of, that's kind of what, what happened. It's all, and it was good timing too, because by that time, I think the whole uh, backlash against hard rock and metal had started dying down there was new appreciation. Big uh, festivals were starting in Europe. Yeah. You know, Vakken became a th so it it died down. But it was a very the nineties. Yeah, it was a very strange period. Yeah, absolutely. And but during that same time, you also got the chance to audition for Ozzy. And you, uh, if I remember, you played a couple of shows or one show. I cannot remember right now. I mean, you were still, you know, pretty young for compared to other musicians involved in in, in the band, that, and you got the chance to play with Geezer and Ozzy in the same band. And I mean, how does it feel like for someone so young and just, you know, exploring jazz and everything else? You just get the chance to play with Ozzy and Geezer. 
Uh, that was completely surreal. At that point, I think I was already sort of uh, on on my path towards just taking a few years off just to study and just to see where that took me. And I would have been ha happy just, you know, being a lesser known guitar player playing breweries and coffee shops. And, but then, yeah, that, <laughs> that Ozzy call came through and uh it was okay that's that was one rare gig i would just have dropped everything for and just done it because it's awesome you know <laughs> it's and uh and I, I didn't even know at the time geezer was playing with him i flew out to this audition and there's geezer and so half the band is black sabbath and i'm like okay whatever happens this is really really cool <laughs> you're basically tony ayomi at that at that at that room i guess <laughs> tony and and randy yeah yeah actually yeah because yeah, you know, we're playing uh, mostly ozzy songs but a couple sabbath songs you know paranoid and i forget what else it was a really interesting experience um i was surprised at how dysfunctional it felt because it was just um like a lot of most of the band didn't seem to know what was going on like they knew we were auditioning people. We tried this guy. We tried that guy. Um, apparently, when I played, it went really well. And they stopped auditions and wanted to do a live show. And then the live show was, it was uh, I think Ozzy had a sore throat. So the whole thing was canceled. It was planned, and then it was canceled. And then it was planned again, and then it was, and I <laughs> geezer like getting really annoyed uh and he would he would actually be gone in about six months so i think it was kind of a turbulent period in the aussie world um they didn't have he didn't have, he, he wasn't doing the osbournes yet which would just really reignite his career uh but the new that the new record at that time i think i still have the demo of it or the unreleased cassette it was osmosis which was a great, it was a great record. And uh, there were all these stories, like I had heard Zach Wilde was hanging out with, pre-sobriety was hanging out with Axel and Axel was, you know, like putting him in a headlock saying, yeah, I'm done, me and Slash aren't getting along, you know, you're the guy, man, you're the guy. <laughs> so he was gonna supposedly join Guns N' Roses, but I don't know, I don't know how much truth there, but it, it was just, craziness craziness so anyway finally the show did get called it, it, it was on and um there was it was so last minute there was some miscommunication about uh getting the equipment there so like i think only like one of the techs and uh the drummer at the time team castronova and me like we had to load the equipment in the truck and I'm just, and I just imagine, you know, this is Ozzy Osbourne, this arena act. There's got to be like this machine where everything's taken. And it was like, I suddenly I'm like in high school, like huffing gear. We, we go to do the gig. They, t they told me, you know, when Ozzy comes in, he, he likes to be alone before the show. Just let it, yeah, I, oh, absolutely. I you know, won't even talk to him. Like, so I go find this room that nobody's in and suddenly Ozzy comes into the room, decides he's, He's going <laughs> to take over the room. And I wouldn't let me go. <laughs> and he just starts shadow boxing and talking in that voice. You, you know, you know, Alex, when we get out there, you know, just do your thing. I'm not one of these. They think I'm this fucking perfectionist. Uh, you know. <laughs> I mean, to you could just, yeah, you couldn't make it up. In fact, when the Osborne show came on TV, I'm like, oh, yeah, because I, I lived this for about a week. <laughs> and the show went great. The show went really well. And I was told, by, you know, by the road crew and everybody else, like, Ozzy has not, we haven't seen Ozzy this happy since before, you know, all the auditions and everything. So it seemed like things were going to go really well. But I, I had also gotten these messages, uh, never directly, too. I know, yeah, I know who they were coming from. It was the person running the show, who was married to Ozzy. <laughs> but things like, you know, can you 
lower the guitar? Can you stand this way? Can, you know, and I realized, oh, she's and I knowing what I know about uh, the entertainment business now, I, I get it. I mean, she's seeing something. She's not. She's focused on the the image, and she was so used to Zach Wilde, just hulking lumberjack that does these wild poses, and the guitar is down to his knees, and you know that's that's just not not how I play. So. Every, I got all these congratulations after the show, but I never got one from her. And then I never heard anything. I had to follow up. And then I, I figured out that um, there was the, the guitarist that they went with, he was a very good player, um, Joe, uh, Joe Holmes. Yeah. Was, you know, was always sort of in the mix. And apparently he was at auditions in the past. Yeah, and like what I think was selected at one point, and it, it's, it's the whole thing was very confusing. But he was yeah. like almost there, and then they worked things out uh, so that he was going to beat the guitarist for for this tour. So, um, so yeah, I was kind of I was hoping it would work out, but I also just greatly appreciated the whole experience. And then when I saw uh, much later, when I saw clips of the tour. Um, you could barely see him. They, I think they reached a point where they decided, okay, we're not going to make the guitarist such a f- feature. Yeah. Right? So he was really, like, dimly lit and put in the back, and I don't think he was even on, on a recording that I'm aware of. Right? Yeah. yeah. And a few years later, uh, you know, Gus G was the guy, and he was a little more featured. And then, of course, Zach ended up back, who... Yeah. Should have been there all along, probably. But <laughs> so it was a crazy, crazy experience. But it, you know, definitely um, a unique one. And just to have gone through that and to uh, have played with half of Sabbath. I mean, how many people can say they they did that? Okay, Alex, uh, I'm not going to take any much of your time. This has been an absolute honor talking to you. Yeah. So I really hope you know that uh, we'll see more of you in the future. Absolutely. My pleasure. I enjoy the the site and uh, appreciate you having me.